Well, well thank, thank you very much. As John and Indy said, uh, you know, we're all in on DRCA. And um, we're also all in with you here in, in, in Philly. There's a very close relationship, as you know, between Sloan Kettering and Penn in this area. Um, Susan and Kate and, and Kara and the whole team here. It's, it's a great honor to be here, and, and thank you for, for this extraordinary award. So this is where I was just a month ago. Um, and uh, you know, 30 years seems a very short time for BRCA, and I can tell you this event took three minutes, and it seemed like it was a very short time. All right, so this is a, a, another shot. This is to distract you from my conflict of interest. <laughs> but your CMA said, I don't have a conflict of interest. So we're set. This is actually what it looks like through a 400 millimeter lens. This was a beautiful event, and I've been to 12 of them, so you can trust me. And I'm going to sprinkle in, since it's my award talk, I can put in my decorations, right? So I'm going to use my astronomy uh, themes here uh, to illustrate uh, and give you some background. So we're going to talk today. It's going to be a mix. There's going to be some technical stuff, some genetics, a little bit of history, um, and then at the end, a little bit of policy. So a little bit for everybody. We're going to talk about why is it now, 30 years after BRCA, we still don't know what the associated cancers are. That's what we call you know, the phenotype. Why don't we are really sure what the risks are? Right? And that's the, the, the issue of penetrance. We're going to talk about the role of isolated populations. That's the Ashkenazi role that, that it has had, and I played a part in that. We're going to talk about very large studies that have been done looking at the penetrance, the second primary cancers. I'm going to show you some things that you might not always think about that come into play when you're thinking about making these kinds of deductions about what risks are. And then I'm going to talk about the modifiers. If you have a mutation, what are the genomic modifiers that lead you to either get an ovarian cancer, to get a pancreas cancer, or to get another breast cancer, and what we can do about that, OK? And then at the end, the population. It's a lot of Ps, population, penetrance, a lot of alliteration, right? The other one, though, is per personal, OK? And I listened to Fergus's talk last week, uh, last year, and he started personally, so I'm going to start personally, too. And, and you'll get a little bit of a historiographic take you know, through the history of all of this. So 1986, all right, what was happening in 86? So uh, yeah, we were having sports rivalries in the Northeast. We were having tragedies in the Middle East. Uh, and in the middle, we had the breast cancer susceptibility. Uh, this was retinoblastoma in 1986, um, kind of buried in this front page. And you couldn't really tell this was cancer susceptibility, but that's, that's what it was. At the same time, this is uh, Larry Norton, who had hair back in the early 1980s <laughs> and was studying lymphoma. Um, he was transitioning into his great area in breast cancer to actually uh, seeing both uh, patient types. Um, and I was a firm lymphoma guy. I actually written a New England Journal article at the time. I was in the lab. I did all the southern blots for this stuff. So I was a lab guy to start. But secretly, I was doing that astronomy thing. I took my three-week-old older daughter, which my wife was like, I can't take a three-week-old three -week on a plane to see Halley's Comet, which was a huge disappointment. Look at that. It was like nothing. I, I'll show you better ones. <laughs> But that's what I did. And while I was doing that, the real scientists were working. Mary Claire King and Mark Skolnick were, at that time, uh, trying to positionally clone the BRCA1 gene. And Mark was being recruited at Memorial. You know, we spent a lot of time doing recruitment entertainment. You take him out to dinner, right, and all the things. And so Mark was there. I went out to dinner. Larry Norton set this entire thing up. And he was smitten on getting them to come. Um, and at the end, Mark said, I don't think so. Actually, his wife said, I'm not coming to New York. Uh, that often happens in recruitments. And why did Mark stay behind? Well, because he had this situation in Utah where he had a population of people that started from upstate New York and migrated to the West um, and followed a, a religious principle that allowed them to have polygamy. So they, Brigham Young had 30 wives. That's his pedigree that's shown here. Um, and so for a geneticist, this was a meiotic paradise. You couldn't have be better. And not only that, they paid attention to genealogy. And some of my Holocaust patients I would send over to Lincoln Center to the, get their family histories because they could convert ancestors. This was quite an extraordinary genetic uh, uh, experiment. And it led to the identification of BRCA1. These were all Mormon families, uh, Latter-day Saints, uh, where the critical recombinants uh, led to the identification of BRCA1. 
also BRCA2, um, although the Brits really got their first stratton um, with BRCA2 and then the Utah group. I had no role to play in any of this, um, except I was on, I guess, the, the, the BRCA2 papers, but we didn't contribute very much in New York, just enough to get a middle authorship. But what we did have in New York was another population like the Mormon group. So the Jews, um, a little two seconds of Jewish history here. The Ashkenazis are not the majority of Jewish population in Israel. Um, the Oriental or Mizrahi Jews never left the Mideast. There were about 850,000 of them. They were expelled from all of the countries uh, in that region in 1948. So they actually are back where they started from. Uh, the Ashkenazi Jews, the group that we have as a majority here in the United States, 90, 98% of us, came, uh, the Ashkenazi means German. Um, in Hebrew, they came up with the Germans and settled in Western Europe. And the Sephardic Jews were ejected from Spain in 1492, uh, and they went north, and they also went west. So why this interest in Jewish history from someone who didn't study very much uh, of the Old Testament? Well, that is because uh, we found these mutations in New York. When I saw this blot, I couldn't believe that these were all the same mutation. This is Susan Newhausen, um, who is shown here, uh, who, with whom we had this uh, wonderful my God, look at this blot. This was a very common mutation. In fact, it was the most common of the BRCA2 mutations, pretty much. Um, but what was paradoxical was that if you looked at early onset breast cancer, and this was the initial paper, the proportion of BRCA2 early onset cancers was lower than BRCA1. It was the 8% versus 20% that's shown here. So if it was less common in early onset, but more common in the population, it must be weaker, right? because it's common, but not, and that was, we inferred the penetrance from that very first paper, uh, and the second paper we did with NYU, where we looked at, um, at, at, at families coming in for prenatal testing to get, the, to get the frequency. So right off the bat, in the very initial description, we knew that this was a weaker or a lower penetrant mutation. Um, I also, at that same year, published in the New England Journal of Medicine a picture of a comet. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, you know, it was like the trifecta, you know, Two nature genetics papers and an astronomy paper, you know, all in the same year. So 10 years go by, and this is every paper published over those 10 years that related to the risk of BRCA cancer. I wrote this editorial for James. It's amazing to think, there they are. There are all the references, okay? No more than that. And what we saw was that the families-based ascertainments were, had a very high risk, this 95% risk, the linkage ascertainments. But the population-based ascertainments had this lower level of risk associated. So we had this huge spread in the clinic. Is your risk 20% or is your risk 95%? And we lived like this, OK, for uh, quite a period of time. The linkage studies also showed us prostate cancer. The, we had this from the uh, studies that were done uh, up in the Scandinavian countries, in Iceland. Um, we saw this also in North America. You know, like to point out, not everybody, you know. So these are papers from reputable groups, and they say there is no prostate cancer with BRCA. It's interesting when you look at it in retrospect, but what happens is you get bias, and if you have a whole group ascertained for one cancer, you may not have the other cancer. So these reputable groups actually missed the boat on that, but they quickly came back and said, yes, that of course they're associated. And we in our New York Ashkenazi population absolutely had prostate cancer, part of this right from the get-go. So this guy, John Hopper, is a very colorful character. I think some of you may know John. Yes, Susan's laughing. He's kind of a combative gentleman. Um, and he felt this was almost conspiratorial, that we were exaggerating these risks of BRCA. And you can see he actually wrote here in his, our risks in Australia, we only 40%, Ken. I think this whole thing is exaggerated, he said, right? <laughs> This is, that, was, that was John with his dog barking in the background, you know? Um, and there were a very uh, sort of uh, emotionally wrought set of letters to, to science about how we were overblowing these risks. So what we had the Ashkenazi population was we could do the Jurassic Park thing and test people who were no longer alive. And we did that by getting their paraffin blocks. By the way, nobody does this anymore. We still do it in New York. I still have that CLIA lab running. It's a nice thing we do in counseling. If you have a relative, we can test the relative if she's not alive anymore. Um, so what we were able to do were a series of studies with people who may not necessarily have been with us, right, um, to consent, but we did this anonymously. And from there, 
we saw that John Hopper was pretty much correct, that those risks were, and you can see the numbers, 46 to 59 percent for BRCA1, 26 to 38 percent for BRCA2, uh, and they're a little bit higher than he said. But those are pretty much the ballpark numbers that we have right now, kind of in the middle of the boat. We also did it for, um, for ovarian cancer. Uh, we showed the associations with pancreatic. All these cases done in Ashkenazi populations. And then we showed the negatives. You know, we'd have patients come in, I have a lymphoma. Is it associated? No, it's not. Well, how do you know? Well, I, I, I did it. I looked at a lot of Jewish people with lymphoma. It was a negative paper. Um, and similarly, colon cancer. There's not an association with colon cancer. So we did this right in the beginning. And this is our kind of little chart that we put, oops, put together in the beginning. And we were right about almost everything on here, but we weren't right about all. And I'm going to talk to you about uterine and lung uh, as we come along a little bit further. So a little more Jewish history. How did these mutations have to be uh, come to be? Well, the Jewish population was near extinction for several centuries in Europe. We think the population of uh, Ashkenazi Jews, those are those ones that went up to Western Europe, got down into the 10,000 range in like the, around the 15th century, 16th century. And at that point, these rare bottlenecks occurred. And it's not one founder mutation. These are all founder mutations. It was happening constantly in every program. You'd have a random selection, and that individual would be allowed to reproduce, but only with their neighborhood. Okay, and that's how these mutations came to be. So we got to typing these uh, to see how old these mutations were. Our Ashkenazi mutation was relatively young compared to the BRCA1 mutation. The mutation that causes Lynch syndrome, we were talking earlier about a form of Lynch syndrome, a more recent mutation. And the one that we were talking about this morning, which is the APC I1307K mutation, um, I didn't comment, uh, by the way, on this this morning, because I never considered this a real mutation, and I co-discovered it. It's just a SNP. And in fact, we never tested for it in New York, but Bert Vogelstein, who I collaborated with, thought this was the greatest thing, and they started testing for this at Hopkins. And now we all have to test for it because it's on our panels. And it's very common in the Ashkenazi population, but it really doesn't change our screening, as the speaker this morning uh, pointed out. Anyway, it's a very old mutation. It's a pre-Semitic mutation. And I've actually had the experience of counseling a member of a royal family of a country in the Middle East to say, oh, you have a Jewish mutation. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see it is actually um, high in the Middle East. And by the way, that business about ignore it if you don't see it in the in the uh, you know in a Jewish population, I didn't comment. That's not biological, you know. It's it is what it is, and the only reason you don't see that is because you don't have the proper controls with that mixture. But we can talk about that later. It is a low risk colon cancer um, allele, but fortunately not one you have to change your management about. So I had this idea. Let's see if we could just do a lot of gene discovery in the Ashkenazis. And ten years after we discovered BRCA2. I did this little Kedunkin experiment. Let's just take 19 Jewish men with male breast cancer and run this new AFI SNP chip and see if we could have discovered BRCA2. And we could have. OK, so there it is. OK, it was the highest. This is the Manhattan plot, the <laughs> biggest building. So with 19 Jewish men with breast cancer, we could have discovered BRCA2. We wouldn't have needed Utah or anything. Of course, it would have been 10 years later, right? So the idea then was, let's do genome-wide association studies, but only you do it in Ashkenazi Jewish individuals, because we have this large heterogeneity and large LD blocks. You know, when you give these talks, the tendency is to talk about only your victories, OK? But you have to talk about your failures, too. It, this one didn't work, OK? So we did it. It's published in a good journal. PNAS at the time was kind of like, you know, that's the Proceedings of the National Academy. We found the SNP. But the LD blocks in the Ashkenazis weren't as broad as we thought they were. And, and this is right at the same time Doug Easton then did it with tens of thousands of individuals from a large population. And that's how FGFR2 and those SNPs were found. So good shot, but we missed it. So what do you do when you lose? You change teams. <laughs> and Doug, we'll join your team, OK? And these guys were already working with BCAC and Simba. It was one of the most fun things, I have to say, we did. So first, we got all the BRCA2 carriers that weren't Jewish and all the BRCA2 carriers that were Jewish. And look at the Jewish individuals, all a straight line, all related. And then we, did, we actually did the first Jewish hat map, and we found that we're all fourth cousins of each other. Okay, That's the way it works with us Ashkenazi Jews. So other things we found in the Ashkenazi Jews, we could see compound heterozygotes. Children of somebody with the mutation I discovered marry someone who has a hypomorph. 
and not good things happen because the kid winds up getting a brain tumor and Fanconi anemia. And in this family, it happened twice because this individual's relative marries another not Jewish girl who's not related to the first one who has the mutation I discovered, and they get another child with a brain tumor. And so this came out, we published it, and now this is part of prenatal testing. If you're going to see someone, uh, family uh, that are both uh, Jewish, you want to be sure that this doesn't happen again. The other thing it, we sometimes we didn't say. So in the in New England Journal paper that you all graciously mentioned, which was the first prospective study that showed the efficacy of prophylactic ovarian surgery, um, I never even said in the paper that 70% of the people were Jewish because it wasn't relevant because we generalized this to the whole population. So just to say that you learn a lot you know, from isolated populations <coughs> that benefit the world. A little caveat, and I know we had a distinguished speaker yesterday. He happens to be a major person here in your department of pathology and you guess believe in the salpingectomy. So I don't want to say anything that is, I think, yes, that most of these ovarian cancers happen in the tubes. But this is a prophylactic one that we found, and this is not in the tubes. And this is a case in New York of a woman with a mutation that had a salpingectomy and has an ovarian cancer. So it's not all of them. I'm cautious about this, and I think we should be doing this on clinical trials. I'm sure it's right that it's most of them, but um, I, we're care I'm cautious about saying rush to do the salpingectomy um, if you can do a, 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 a salpingo-oophorectomy, and you can do these under, uh, under, uh, uh, look on it, uh, under general anesthesia, but it's a day procedure. The other shout out I wanted to do was, since we're talking Ashkenazi, it would be wrong of me not to say there's a founder mutation that causes breast cancer in the Ashkenazis. It's not BRCA. One or two, that's a founder, and that's in P53. Is Kara here? Yeah, I've been looking for you like the last two days because I want to talk to you. Um, so, so, this is, um, so this is her paper, and we gave our cases to you for that. The 21 of these G3PR, this is a founder, it's a low penetrant P53. We have 23 more. Kara, we're having our discussion, okay? And one of them is not high penetrant, okay? And I want to talk to you about that, and I'll tell you why in this talk, okay? So it's an exception. So it's a Jewish founder, low penetrant, except one, okay? And that one person may teach us a lot. So anyway, I joined the other team. I have to tell you, joining Simba was one of the best things that happened in my ac academic life. The Brits know how to do research and have a good time. They had meetings all over the world. Stockholm, Copenhagen, Vienna, London, Paris. This is, this is, this is a northern lakes called Lake Garda. Who knows about a place like this? The British do. You know, that's where we go for vacation. Let's go to Lake Garda for the next meeting. What do you think, Georgia? Yes, let's do that, OK? And everyone is there. It's incredible. And they drink, and they have great food. We don't do this in the United States. They also do great science. Um, and in fact, they had the monopoly on it because they had every BRCA character in the world in their consortium. And so this is a summary of the Simba data. And you don't really need to make a fancy chart because you just look at the editorial to the Simba paper, and it's all there. These are all of the cancer types associated with BRCA1 or 2. There are the confidence intervals. It's all been done, essentially, by this consortium. Nah, we need a, a few little adjustments, right? So one of the ones that's not on there is the one I mentioned, the one we missed, which was the uterine cancer. So there is this high-grade uterine cancer that's associated with BRCA1. And we didn't see that in the beginning. And Noah Kalf, when he was with us, made that observation. And then we, he published this paper, and others su subsequently, absolutely. And this is tricky. It's, it was in tamoxifen, BRCA1, but also in BRCA2. And it changes our counseling now, because you can't just do that same day procedure, uh, just you know BSO. You have to be talking hysterectomy, because of the small but significant risks that are associated with that. And then I made a couple of other little edits on that thing, this thing here. Um, I really don't think that colorectal cancer should be up there for BRCA. It's not, right? And melanoma, definitely not. And I, I did a huge review of this, so I don't know why that's there. Melanoma is not associated with it. And the prostate, we're going to talk a lot about. And prostate and, and BRCA1 is weak. But otherwise, now stomach cancer was on that list. 
And this is interesting because this is real. The Japanese have confirmed this where there's a lot of stomach cancer. And here's chemo prevention you didn't think about. Ask if the person's got an ulcer. And if they do, ask if they have H. pylori. And if they have H. pylori, then they get treated with antibiotics. Any of you, I have twice had H. pylori ulcers. The antibiotics are awful. But that's chemo prevention because they get stomach cancer in the context of the BRCA mutation. We don't actually add that onto our NCCN guidelines, do we? So penetrates for prostate cancer. So um, there's another organization that has spun up. I think it's modeled after this one uh, in the Midwest called the Cure BRCA. I sat at the table at your benefit. Um, and he's, um, he's, he's also totally committed to BRCA in males and put together this team. You can see the names on here. So basically, it's all the Aminon's Greases to write this huge review of male uh, risks in BRCA1 or 2. Um, and what's interesting, uh, I mean, you can summarize, but you see that, look at the range for prostate cancer. Uh, in, the, in the Simba, it's 21 to 35%. In a meta-analysis, it's 43 to 78%. So what is it? What is the risk of prostate cancer associated? And I'm going to just take a little riff on prostate cancer here for a minute. So it turns out that if you look at metastatic prostate cancer, you're going to have an uh, incidence of BRCA2 of 5.3%. If you look at localized prostate cancer, it's 0.2%. We actually did the stats for this. This is the Stand Up to Cancer paper. It was a pleasure, and it got me engaged in prostate cancer. It also was interpreted by it, BRCA2 is aggressive marker for prostate. You've heard that, right? BRCA2, aggressive prostate cancer, OK? So now here, this is a very pretty comet. Um, <laughs> this one I actually published in an astronomy magazine. These things you can't predict, OK? The eclipses you know, right? But this one you just got to be ready to deploy, right? This one is gorgeous. Like, this one, yeah, can't tell you when the next one will be. So what about aggressive prostate cancer? Well, we wrote a paper on aggressive prostate cancer. Nayrod wrote a paper on aggressive prostate cancer. And he's going to say, what do you mean it's not aggressive? Of course it's aggressive. We know that. But here's the trick. And there are many other papers. Okay, I've listed them here in JNCI, worst outcome, almost at all annals of oncology. But the question is, and, and apropos of this morning's conversation, BRCA1 and triple negative breast cancer. Well, BRCA1 is associated with TNBC, TNBC with BRCA1, but they're not mutually exclusive. Is BRCA1 a negative prognostic marker? Is BRCA1 a negative prognostic marker in triple negative breast cancer? And listening to Mark's talk, I might think, gee, maybe it's the other way around, because maybe they'll actually respond to the PARP drugs. So in prostate cancer, you've got to do the comparison, not to all prostate cancer, but to sort of the prostate version of triple negative breast cancer, which is men with advanced localized prostate cancer, which is a Gleason score greater than 7, a stage greater or equal to 3, and a high PSA. And in our paper, in the Gallagher paper, and the others, we didn't do that. We just took all local prostate cancer, and many of those are benign. And of course, BRCA was worse. But when you look at that subset, and that's a bad subset, there's a 50% survival for that group of prostate cancers, all comers, there is no negative prognostic significance for BRCA2. Now, this is unpublished data, so don't photograph it and all the rest, you know. Um, but you know, we're sharing this. Now, this, I'm the head of a PO1 in prostate cancer, so I got seriously interested in this at Memorial, and this is one of our projects. And the, we have three cohorts in here. So if you look, you've got the Harvard School of Public Health, this little cohort with the shield on it. Um, I used to go to school there and look at that shield every day, thinking I was a soldier. Um, that, there are 1,200, and this is the physician's health study okay, that went into that group. So this is a prospective group. There's no bias in that group. And then you've got the retrospective studies from Dana-Farber, 708, and 430 from our place. And it's there, whoops, and there is no association with uh, an adverse outcome in BRCA2 or any of the HR repair genes, for that matter. Not the case, though, for de novo. If you present with de novo metastatic uh, prostate cancer, it is an adverse prognostic marker. And that's what our, our, our other projects in the grant, including uh, it's, it's actually a, a, a large project involving investigators from Boston as well, to see if there are other somatic and polygenic prognostic markers that could explain that. OK, this was the eclipse in 2017 in Wyoming. We started in, in Kansas City. 
Andy, I, where's Andy? Yeah, and we wound up in Casper, Wyoming, 800 miles, okay, in half a day because of the weather, okay? Same thing happened as this, okay? Another beautiful event. So what we do at Memorial, and I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, the, the tumor normal sequencing. So you know, we invested, not we, but the Kravises invested, I think 300, 600 million, I, we lose track, to do the tumor normal sequencing, which was a revolutionary investment. Um, and so what we did right from the get-go is every tumor, we did the germline. Boom, boom, side by side. And that the first look of a 1,000 of those cases, half of the findings in the germline that I saw, and I had to do this, this paper pretty much on my own because um, it was a complicated, a very complicated hairball to, to, to wrestle down to the ground. And Mark and I wrestled with this for a couple of years. The two of us just, we just decided to grind it out. Um, and what we found were these off-target, like, see this bladder cancer? What's that? The ampullary cancer, biliary cancer, right? So what's that, right? Um, so now we're going to go through a bunch of papers that came out of um, our place. So the first thing is look at the tumor. What's the biallelic loss? So this is a, a look at ampullary cancer is showing, right? Look at that signal, okay, for biallelic loss. So 47 cases, see that? With biallelic loss in BRCA2, so that's looking real. The big paper, the Nature paper, looked at the... Um, display of the homologous repair profile in the tumors and associated that with the canonical BRCA-associated tumors, breast, ovarian, prostate, showed that there was greater biallelic loss. Those would respond more to PARP inhibitors. That was the major point of the paper. But buried in that paper um, were these other findings. And if you look here, you can see there's esophagogastric cancer also with biallelic loss in BRCA. And these numbers are not numbers to go write home about, so don't photograph them, but I just asked our colleagues in, in the lab to give us these LOH numbers, because they're kind of hard, hard to get from the literature. This is what, what they are right now at MSK. And you can see the ampullary is 44% for BRCA1, 62% for BRCA2. There's mesothelioma at 69%. What's that? Esophageal cancer at 38%. These numbers are going to change because they're not going to publish this until we're now at 100,000. But that at least ballparks where we stand with the LOH. And lung cancer, and I've mentioned lung cancer a couple of times, we published Samanti Mukherjee of 5,000 lung cancer cases. We have 7% of those with DNA damage response, and 50% of those are also biallelic. Now, lung cancer, what, lung cancer didn't exist in humans until 1890s, okay? It's a completely environmental cancer. Did you know that? It's an interesting fact. Yeah, the Greeks did autopsies, and they found tumors all over the body, but never in the lungs, okay? It's a total creation of our environment, but there's a susceptibility to lung cancer, which, well, look at BRCA1. These folks are disproportionately non-smokers. So what does that mean? That means, well, maybe through HR defects, they are susceptible to other exposures, for example. We don't know. So you need to do an epidemiologic gene-environment interaction, but it's an interesting finding, um, it, it, isn't it? Um, and uh, also, you'll see NBN on that list, and I'll show you, and you see ARCC3 on the lung cancer list, and we'll come back to that. Samantha has a huge grant. She actually won the lottery of phd them. She actually not only got her R01, but was converted into R37. So she said, the seven-year grant, it's five million bucks, so we're doing a lot of lung cancer work. This is a lunar eclipse. Um, this is what happens when the Earth's shadow goes over the moon. It's really quite beautiful. And this is photographed from like 74th and Park, okay, in New York, okay, which was interesting. The doorman of the other building said, can I take a look in there? What are you looking at? Okay, that's a lunar eclipse. Um, I'm going to talk about multiple primary cancers and modifiers of penetrance. Now, multiple primary cancers, did you know that one in five cancers now in the United States are occurring in somebody that's had a cancer already? That's pretty amazing, 20%. Well, why did they get those cancers? Well, maybe they were treated and cured. So maybe they had chemotherapy exposure causing them to get, or maybe it was environmental, or maybe it was genetic, right? So it's a hard, it's a hard group to study. But we have collected four or more cancers, 141 people that have had four or more cancers. And yeah, isn't that amazing? And 51 folks that have had five cancers. So we're sequencing the heck out of their tumors 
this is a basic sciences project, but I wanted to show you the epidemiology here. There are associations that are not understood epidemiologically. So this is just using sear rates for the epidemiologists, pure grinding it out. And I'm showing this to you because in our registries, we tend not to pay attention to multiple primary tumors. And this is an example. So this is where we are at MSK with our sort of hit list, okay? Um, and I know we're interested only in BRCA today, but I'm showing you everything. And there's really not much on the first part of this graph that's gonna really shock you. But if you include now all of the cancers that each person had over the course of their life, so it's not, oh, I came in, I had my metastatic cancer of the lung, but when I was a young first grade teacher, I had thyroid cancer. You have to grade that as a thyroid cancer and a lung cancer too, right? And when you do that, boom, okay, now you're starting to see all kinds of things that are interesting. Um, and so, for example, there's the BRCA2 mesothelioma association, um, you know, check two with esophageal cancer. There's a lung association with NBN. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. There's the ERCC4, right? So I'm showing you that with this additional phenotypic resolution, you can see associations. And I'd be interested to go back to some of our larger studies to see. So I'm going to tell you one story because it started out of, we do a lot of collaborations together, okay? Um, in fact, Kara, I think, maybe remember, because very often, I, it may have been Kara said, is this family or the other one? Like, this is interesting, you know, this MBN, right? So we had this, um, we had a, a, a family, and I'll, actually I'll show you this family. This was, this was in the prompt registry, Susan. This was a woman with breast cancer. She had a daughter with ALL, and she had a sister with bladder cancer. And she had an NBN mutation. And why is that a problem? So NBN is a rare recessive disorder called Nimogen breakage syndrome, and the parents actually tend to get cancers. There's a founder mutation in Poland and in French Canada that was associated with breast cancer. So all the commercial companies put NBN on the panel. Any genetic cancers? Remember? Remember? And then what happened to it? It went bye-bye, okay? And why did it get taken away? Because Fergus <laughs> and Doug Easton wrote these two New England Journal papers, and they said, NBN sayonara, okay, for breast cancer. And so very quickly, the commercial companies took NBN off of their list, probably the right thing that they did. Um, and uh, so then we came back to this. Uh, now, because these commercial companies were no longer testing for it. So we had multiple primary cancers with thyroid, renal cell. We had a guy who had prostate, lung, and CLL. We actually looked at the mutations themselves, took them into the lab to see are they functionally significant. And uh, he, these are two patient-derived mutations. This is a truncating mutation. This is also a patient-derived mutation. And if we look at the cell viability, and this is after we radiate them with four grays of radiation, you can see the difference between these patient samples and the wild type here, and that's quite significant, and these are normal controls. And then if we look at CAP1 phosphorylation, which is how we look at ATM activation downstream, if you have good eyes, you can see this is fainter. These are our two patient samples, and this is a control. So this is a hypomorph. These are real mutations, okay? No problem there, but now what? So they're not significant in breast cancer. They're not significant in any single cancer, but if you look at all cancers, we get this La, this, this value, which is significant. So it's a pan-cancer association. That's a kind of a funny story. This guy, um, uh, Barcelona postdoc, miserable. He was in the lab during postdoc. He does not happy, so he, he's leaving. Gone, we lose him. He's going to the dark side, we call it. But the dark side was Ambry. Um, so he's at Ambry for like two weeks. And he said, hey, Ambry has all this NBN data from before it was banned right, or removed, and so redid all of it with the AMBRI data, and there it is, it's the same odds ratio, and there you go, okay? So NBN may be prematurely, you know, demise was premature, but I mention this because, and I think Mark alluded this morning, and it's different in, in prostate and breast. In prostate cancer, this is on an FDA indication for PARP, uh, and it is significant in PARP, but yet in breast, not so much. So interesting about NBN because it's, it is in the same pathway as BRCA uh, in homologous repair. It's upstream and it signals ATM, which does the damage. All right, so now we're going to go into the modifiers discussion. Uh, and uh, 
Susan actually wrote a, a lovely review of all the non-genetic modifiers, but we are talking on the genetic modifiers. So I collected a lot of these patients with these little old ladies um, who had a BRCA2 mutation but never got cancer in their life, and their daughters who then got a breast cancer in their 30s at a very early age with the same mutation. Right, so what is it? It's in the diet, their exercise? No, we don't think that's the case. And so Fergus got himself a huge R01, and I got money from the Star Foundation. It must have been between us like four or five million dollars. And we went to the consortium meeting, which was that year, who knows, in Amsterdam, and said, we'll give you the money, but Fergus said, but we're going to write the papers, which was good. I'm glad he did, because otherwise, well, in any event. So we wrote those papers. And the end result of all of that is what you heard today. We now have a panel, and I don't think anybody else is doing what you heard uh, Jada talk about, where we have patients that come in with mutations, and we modify their risk according to these SNPs. Now, you know, I, Fergus knows I'm sort of skipping that what we wound up finding was there was nothing specific for the BRCA1 or 2. These are all the polygenic backgrounds for, for estrogen receptor positive and negative cancer. But it worked really well in modifying BRCA cancer risk. And, and I don't know, Jada, you didn't show this this morning, did you? Um, but this is, these are actually the patients uh, that we've taken through. And this is with, with Susan, um, and this is with Judy. So this is the Boston, New York, um, Philadelphia project. And Mark Robson and Jada have taken it forward, and we're going to take it to the next level, which you heard about this morning with ATM. But I'm interested in this because, yes, there's the behavioral, the intervention, but what about the biology of this? You know, we, we're, we're finding these individuals at the extremes, and this person at the extreme happens to be the daughter of a good friend, okay, who went through this. She's a medical professional, and she's not happy because she's at this 98% risk, okay, and she's willing to volunteer to do anything for research. So what do we can do? So the point I wanted to make about the modifiers is that um, we don't have a good handle on the modifiers other than these SNPs. One of the most spectacular no results in brief that I've ever been involved with, and Fergus and I were middle authors in this thing, but I mean, it was in a, in a journal that says nothing, there was nothing found. 445 candidate genes. It's truly remarkable, isn't it? This was years of effort of the consortium, and not one marker was found to modify BRCA1 or BRCA2 risk throwing darts, okay, thinking as cleverly as we could. We found the one in BRCA2 that I'm showing here. This is not a general population modifier. It is associated with breast density. And I wanted to mention the parallel for this, which is there's another P53 modifier called XAF1 that modifies P53. That's that bad, you know, Lee Fermini syndrome. There's a weak version of it. It's in Brazil, just like the Ashkenazis have founders. They do in, they do in South America. But this particular modifier functionally attenuates the transactivation of P53 in an elegant paper done by St. Jude. One of the privileges I've had in my life is not mentioned. I've done things other than breast, and I found a couple of childhood leukemia susceptibility genes. One, working with St. Jude, what an experience collaborating with that institution. I, it was my paper, but man, you know, they did RNA-seq, GSCA, genome. I mean, nothing is spared. And this, Kara, is what I want to talk to you about, because we have to take the high penetrant, right, take our high penetrant P53 and, and do everything, and maybe we'll see what that modifier is, which would be really cool. She's up for that. Um, so what are we now going to do with these individuals, right, that want to volunteer to be part of research? Um, now, there's this canary in the mine metaphor, but I wanted to let you know that the British did do this, okay? But um, the Haldane contraption for the canaries, I mean, they would pass out in the mine, right? But they had little oxygen canisters on the top of the Haldane, which then would revive the little birds. Just so this, you know, we want to not be cruel to pets in this talk, okay? Just so you know. Um, this is human subject stuff. So um, this is what our research is going to be, and we're underway. So we're going to take, ask for consent for individuals who are at the high end of this polygenic risk score to let us have some tissue, either through a needle biopsy, which she will agree to, or if they do prophylactic mastectomy, we'll get the normal tissue. We'll make organoids out of, it's not easy, and I, we were talking a lot, I was talking at this conference today a lot to people about organoids, because this is new to me. Um, 
it's very hard to take a normal uh, organoid and engineer a BRCA2 mutation. I learned this here. But if you start with a BRCA2 mutation, you can, and these organoids that are here are from Surat Chandalapati, who has been very gracious with us. Um, and these are BRCA2 breast cancer organoids that are growing. And this is in, he's in Mark's department, Mark. Um, so this is my official thank you to you for that incredible collaboration. Um, and then uh, in Charles Sawyer's group, we are growing prostate organoids. Now, the guy in um, the organization, the foundation in Chicago is interested in prostate cancer, but I'm going to use your funds towards, um, towards this project. And what we are going to do is genomic comparisons in these individuals with BRCA with high and low polygenic background. We're going to find the pathways, and then we're going to target those pathways with drugs. OK, now that sounds very grandiose, OK? But I'll show you in a minute. I've done part of this with another project. I think it's definitely worth a go. Um, and we're going to do it. And we're, we have enough funding. The other advantage we have is a guy named Matt Buis, who will be amazed if he's listening to this talk, because he gave me this slide three days ago. He's a post-GWAS functional genomics guy who's fantastic for this. He did um, Barrett's esophagus work. You may be familiar with his functional pro, uh, potential score. He's already gone through our 146 uh, variants for prostate cancer. And there's some very interesting potential interactors that nobody's looked at. So I think. I think that there's, in the prostate realm, we've got plenty of work to do. I wanted to mention uh, the low-hanging fruit thing, that there's nothing other than BRCA in these genes we've said. Now, this is a close-up of that most recent eclipse. And Kate, uh, sorry, Susan saw this with her binoculars. And that's about seven, eight times the size of the Earth, that thing coming out. Okay? It's called a prominence. So if you look at these charts, still, ha we, we wrote this review, Fergus and Kate, right, 10 years ago. Time flies, right? It hasn't changed. We still have half of breast cancer familiarity is still unknown for high penetrance. And if you look, this paper by Jacques Simard basically did exome sequencing. I think you guys all had families in there. No, actually, our family's Fergus is sequencing for our Simplexo consortium. But it's been trying to get water out of a stone. And you can see, read this, the overall contribution of coding variants in genes beyond the previously known genes is estimated to be small. In other words, nothing came of this that's low-hanging fruit. There's no high penetrant gene that popped out of this extraordinary effort. And this was funded, I think, in Canada as well as by the European Union. Now, I did want to mention, I can now tell you this, because the paper just was put up on the portal in Med Archive. Otherwise, I wouldn't do this. Um, we have a large collaboration with a pharma company where we've sequenced 37,000 prostate cancer cases. We have a candidate gene, and that's the gene. It's this one here. And if you look, it's, it's here, OK? So we ran this in UK Biobank, and it's significant in UK Biobank. So it's interesting. So there's a candidate gene. It's nothing to write home about, because the effect size is two, but it's real. So it's prostate and it's breast. So this is coming out of really crunching uh, sequencing. There are, I wouldn't say low-hanging fruit, but I would say barely edible fruit <laughs> Okay, uh, that still exists. Now, I want to tell you why I think I can do drug discovery, because you know, I need to prove it if I'm going to get a grant. This is a family that I think this maybe was the one, Kara, that that we did together. Um, and it was a male breast cancer. It had an ERCC3. I think I remember on the call. And you said, are they Jewish? You know, I said, that's my department. You know, so, <laughs> um, and so we looked at it, and we saw that, yes, in fact, um, they were Jewish. And yes, it, it's a risk factor for breast cancer in Jews. And we did it in Israel for ER positive breast cancer. St significant. So there you go, another weak Ashkenazi risk marker. So what do you do with that? Well. These leukopatic syndrome repair defects are seen in about 10 to 15 percent of cancer at Memorial. So this is not a pathway without some relevance, although the germline mutations are uncommon. So we actually took the patient mutation, this R109X, put it in an HMLE line, which is a breast cancer cell line, and then we treated it with a drug, which is a poison toward nucleotide excision repair, which is derived from a mushroom which was found in the New York Botanical Gardens. I'm only saying this because I have this fantasy in my mind of this like wedding and mushrooms and someone getting sick. I don't know how it was found, but it's pretty scary. A pretty toxic drug. It's an alkylating agent that kills these NERs. So toxic that we used a derivative of it called Eludin. And we put in mice 
xenografts with this mutation, which we had to kind of kick in an oncogenic rest because otherwise it won't, it won't kill the, the mice. Um, and it kills the mice, but we can rescue it with the NER poison. So for me, you know, this was an important experiment, and it led to us thinking this is a great drug. And this drug we were going to try to repurpose. But then as we went and looked, we saw it has ocular toxicity. It's tough doing drug discovery. Mice, you know, are colorblind. So they have no cones. I didn't know that. So we wouldn't have seen it in the mice. So we started from scratch. And this is a grant that we have from the US government that sponsors drug discovery like this. So we're doing a small molecule screen and a um, in, uh, in silico synthetic lethal screen. It just means going on the web and seeing which pathways are synthetic lethal and a CRISPR screen. The cell lines that we're using are our intellectual property, or I should say Sloan Kettering's intellectual property, the HMLE line, the RT112. Uh, Interestingly, I had to start a company to do this, which for me was new. Um, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a socialist, you know, so this was a leap, but you have to form a company uh, in order to get the grant. So we have the company, um, and we're underway to do this, this study. I have no economic uh, conflict of interest, okay, because this is all early days. So we did a CRISPR screen. Uh, this was done at Cornell Ithaca, where they have great computation. There are synthetic lethals. This is the volcano uh, plot. And I'm not telling you specifically what we're finding, but we have, we have hits in RNA metabolism and DNA repair and replication. And we actually have one compound, and this is at nanomolar concentrations, that looks pretty active against the HMLE line and a compound that looks pretty active against both lines, although the affinity isn't what it should be. So this is how you do drug discovery. For me, this has been new. Um, you can do this. You, I know you can do this at Penn. At Memorial, we have huge core facilities that do all of these experiments, essentially, um, if you can queue them up. And you have the computational savvy uh, to do this. So we're well on our way to doing this. And this is the same kind of thing that I think we'll be doing to target the modifiers, right? Because you ultimately are going to be doing screens. Now we're almost done, OK? I'm only going to give you another, like, seven minutes. and. We're, we're, we're done. But this is the fun part. So this is the population science part. This, by the way, you should see once in your life. Now, apparently, we could have seen this from Philly the last two nights. Did you try? But it was cloudy, right? So we didn't really see it. Um, but uh, if you really want to do this, you got to go to Alaska or go to Tromsø, Norway. OK, that's where we did it. That's where this is, which is a beautiful city north of the Arctic Circle. Population testing. So. Um, Three decades now after BRCA, our testing is flat. Two weeks ago, one of the largest companies went belly up in an auction off sale. Um, the genomics ancestry companies are OK, but they are not doing great. And I've got some ideas about the ancestry companies I may want to talk to you about, because I definitely. Um, because they're in a very powerful position, it's not being leveraged. We have 1.4 million breast cancer survivors. Over a million have not yet been tested. And Alison Curran was supposed to come. I saw her on the hotel list, but I guess she didn't come. She wrote this great paper in JAMA that says that um, we're doing terribly. Uh, in Georgia and California, only 6.8% of people who should be getting genetically tested are being tested. And it's worse in the groups that are historically underserved and underrepresented. So this is not good. Um, and and um, uh, Zofia wrote an editorial about this with, uh, with our department chair, um, not good. And Lynch syndrome also not being tested. So we can do population testing. The real problems with population testing with variants, we do our own testing in-house. And we met just last week to decide very, very generally, how big our panel could be before we got 50% variants. But the insurance companies, bizarrely, want us to have a larger panel rather than a smaller panel. So we're kind of trying to reach the right size. But it's very difficult when you pick up these variants. And then in a paper that I'm going to continue to embarrass Susan <laughs> with until, no, no, she knows. She's got to write this paper, right, which is this, right? Um, the numbers will be changed when she writes the paper, right? But the bottom line will be the same. No, no, we're very busy. It's, we're very busy. I, I have the same, the same issue. So we've got data from our prompt registry that of individuals that have been given variant results, right, a sub substantial proportion of them have been told by their surgeons to have surgery. And I think you might even have numbers that some of them may even have planned surgery, okay? Huh? 
got surgery. All right, so it's even, it's even better, okay? This will be a big paper, okay? Uh, but it's tough, you know, because we're multitasking. But you understand that, okay? So these variants are being misinterpreted by healthcare providers, and people are actually getting surgeries because of them. All right, so if there's not an argument against population screening that includes variants, that'll be it. And I won't mention cost-effectiveness. So we did a study, this is when I think I saw you guys in the synagogue in New York, where we were vainly trying to get recruitment. We decided to do a population screen in the Jewish population, something that I felt I needed to have done, but we never did. Um, and uh, it did not go well. <laughs> um, I sent letters to um, every rabbi of every congregation in New York, volunteering to speak at any time to their congregations about how we could do a test that might save the lives of their, I mean, right? You'd think, that sounds like a good deal, right? Um, and uh, I got two responses to that. Um, and it I thought we'd accrue that thing in six months, and it took us three years, okay? Not only that, when we're giving the results back to patients, 40.5%, data will confirm, of the physicians of those patients who are asked if they would help to give the results back to their own patients at the request of their, of their patients, right? Said, no, we don't want to do that. You do, you do that. You take care of that. That's not good, okay? We're not going to be able to do population testing that way. And what Susan is fixated on, and rightly so, and I think she's going to follow up on our next survey, is only 4% of the people with negative tests who should have more tests had said that they were going to do those additional tests. And if we can't do better than that, then we're no better than a certain company that I won't name. And, but we are, and we are going to do better than that because we, you know, we're invested in this, okay? So, um, so this is just showing that there are challenges. And what I'm not even mentioning here is that we had a technical glitch in the middle of the study where the lab, which is one of the largest laboratories in the world, had a little technical glitch, let's say, okay? And it happens because when you're doing a lot, you know, all it takes is one, right? And we straightened it all out. We retested all the people in the batch, no harm. But it just reminds you that um, doing these types of real-world applications of population screening is different than what you all do in the genetics clinic. So I've been smitten with cascade testing from the beginning. That's just a regular crescent moon because it's telling you that we're just about done, okay? Um, if you see a guy with prostate, how do you uh, counsel the relatives? I did a little arithmetic uh, thing. I actually did the statistics on this pretty much on my own. Um, and, and, I, and it's, you know, it's, this is, there are 3.9 million mutation carriers in the United States for all of the syndromes. And we could find all of them in less than 10 years if we could just get the families to communicate. If we could get 70% of the at-risk relatives to talk to each other, we're done and done. But guess what number we get in clinic? We do not. We're lucky if we get 25%. People don't talk to their first cousins. I'll talk to you about one of my cousins who's at Penn at the end. Um, we're very close, okay? But most people don't talk to their cousins. Um, and so you have problems with Cascade. So we got this large grant. Jada um, did the heavy lifting here. During the pandemic, we were able to talk to any relative of any family member in any state. We had the suspension of the rules. And boy, was that good, you know? Because if you know the sister and the other sisters there, so, you know, I just met your sister, and I know that you're in school. I know that you're, you know, you already have an inroad to the relationship, and then you do your cascade testing, but you can't do that. That's illegal. I can't practice medicine except in New York, Florida, where I'm licensed, Connecticut, I think. I can't do it in Pennsylvania, okay? Um, and so what we figured was a workaround. There are national physician networks, and what we do is those physicians who are licensed in each state, they can consult me to then counsel the patient in their state, so then I can have that relationship, but they're the physician of record and they order the test. It's an interesting workaround. Um, and then the other element to this, so we built all of this internet stuff, and Jada knows, I mean, we meet every week, <laughs> Thursday at 10 o'clock, I'm usually 10 minutes late, and we're working on making this incredible instrument. I would love to do this with all of you um, here once we expand. I know it's like the study that you're doing already with genetic counseling, but this takes it up to the level of, of the physician. Uh, and the other element here is we have an opt-out, which is ethically a little tricky, right? So I ask you for your sister's name and address and say, well, um, 
you have three months to call her, but if you don't get back to me in three months, then I'm going to call her, okay? And our IRB is going to let us do that. You get that? Okay. And that, I can tell you, we couldn't have done, you know, 10 years ago. So that's our opt-out. This is the study. It's a randomization, and we're underway. And I wanted to just show you this case, because we saw it, right, right, Peter, last week. This is one of our first ones. So here it is. So this, this man has a check two pathogenic mutation. It's like the cases you were presenting to me today that I'm, like, scratching my head about. Thyroid cancer, colorectal cancer with check two. So we have to test now her for the check two because of what's her risk for breast cancer. But she's got a brain cancer. So we cascade test her. She's in South Carolina. OK, I talked to her on the phone. And we do it because it's great because it's on the study. But what do we have to test her for? It's like the case you presented. What? And the psychologist and PhD is telling us pot one. That's right. We had to test her for pot one, and we had to test her for P53. So if you're doing cascade testing, it's not just knee jerk. You know, you still have to pay attention to what's going on here. And so she still has to get high quality University of Pennsylvania Memorial Hospital level counseling. And so my fantasy is that we'll have everybody in a cascade consortium network, and I'll call you know, Susan and Judy, and we'll all basically refer to each other so we can all counsel each other's families. And we're going to write our renewal for the R01 in two years. And if anybody's interested in joining this, shoot me an email. It's going to the first customers in this who are going to be our, our group in New York, Philly, uh, Boston, and LA. Um, but we're hoping that we'll do it broadly. I wanted to end just with one or two updates. Two years ago, I told you about this horrendous situation with direct to consumer testing. This is a good civics lesson, right? So I, I, when you get elected into these academies and stuff, you're supposed to, I was talking to, one of our colleagues about this today, social conscience, right? So I wrote this paper. I showed it to you. We have all of these labs. You presented a case today of this bogus, bad quality testing that, unfortunately, a lot of our patients are coming in with. You have one that you presented today. Um, there was a law that was supposed to be passed called the Valid Act. We thought that that might do it. We showed all of these examples of this 31-year-old who gets a test from her raw data. It's not correct. She planned surgery. She sees us like the one you presented. She cancels the surgery. Another one has a check 2 mutation. She's told she has, lin has uh, leaf mini syndrome. It's an appendix right into this paper. And I just, I just did this. Um, and I wrote at the end, this is my opinion only, not that of Memorial Sun Kettering, blah, 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 you know, hoping like a cry in the dark, right? And so sure enough, and I wrote it with a lawyer at NYU who my daughter, who's a lawyer, introduced me to. So that was a good, a good, a good, uh, good connection, Kevin Sharkey. Um, and so what happened is the law never went anywhere, but the FDA decided to regulate. How do you like that? Okay. So they issued this thing, and Scott Gottlieb, who's not the FDA commissioner now, he writes a blog, says that on May 22nd, whatever this means, the CRA deadline, the White House, blah, blah, blah. But this does not. Congress won't stop this now. This is an executive decision of FDA. So there you go. You know, a civics lesson, you know, write your paper, get it peer reviewed, and somebody reads this stuff. And they didn't only read my, st my stuff. There's a lot of other literature that's there. But I'll tell you, our stuff is probably the most on the cancer side of it. Now, I won't say that this will solve the issue. It's unclear how they're going to relate to those companies that reinterpret out other data or even the deep direct to consumer. But the FDA is going to be in on regulating this stuff, and uh, that's going to change, and that's great. We have this paper that will get published soon, and this is the genetic counselors basically telling us across the country we're seeing these cases. It's not just here at Penn. It's not in New York. The other thing, apropos of that great talk that we had this morning, they're also seeing the liquid biopsy cases, and they don't, we don't know what to do with this because they're false positives and false negatives, and that's in this survey, just to point out. So uh, the final, literally last slide is what's my latest concern. And my latest concern is that our guidelines are not concordant. And you heard that in the talk that your genetic counselor superbly gave here at Penn, where he showed Mark led the group. Mark, very modestly in his presentation, didn't point out that he actually led the ASCO guidelines for it. And I must say, did it very, very adroitly and carefully and conscientiously over a period of time with a lot of expert buy-in. Everyone gets tested, according to ASCO, before the age of 65 with breast cancer, regardless of family history. But I sit on all of these 
affords things here, okay? And that's not what NCCN says. And we met last week, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. But we have an issue now in our country of guidelines discordance, right? Where one says to do one, one says to do the other. And the reason that this is a, a problem right now, you may not know about this, but state legislatures are passing laws that require insurers to pay for cancer biomarker testing. They're required. Um, and so I talked to Susan because you're a white state here, okay? So this didn't happen in Penn, but your governor signed this thing, which is called Law One, what's it called? Act One, which looked pretty good to me because it requires the test, but what I heard and learned from you all today is not so fast, it's in multiple stages. And the problem is who's going to enforce this? You know, the state legislature basically is going to send the state legislature police to the insurance companies. Like, how's that going to work exactly? Um, but they are maybe moral suasion, I'm not sure. But the problem is that they're requiring evidentiary guidelines for the insurers to make their decisions. So how does the insurer, if they have discordant evidentiary guidelines, so I'm hoping, I'm in this National Academies Roundtable, and I am hoping that we'll have a meeting in October to talk about this, because the one thing the academies can at least get people in a room. So the conclusions are BRC associations uh, are, are still not defined, even now, between phenotype and penetrance, but we've made a tremendous amount of progress. We have to incorporate population stratification, the polygenic modifiers, uh, that the modifiers of penetrance I think give a wonderful opportunity for some biology so that we can see why are women protected against breast cancer with these polygenic modifiers? Why are men protected against prostate? In addition to having an increased risk, why the protection? And if we can, if we can target that, that would be great. Cascade testing, we should be investing in this. We have a lot more tools. Um, and then the precision prevention, we need these real world problems of laboratory developed tests. So this is my immediate family. Um, this, is, this is everybody there. Um, and the laboratory, the genetic counselors. This is the extended family. Um, this one I put together last week. It's a dangerous slide because you can leave people out. There's some funny little fine Waldo people in here. Um, and this is the one. Um, so there's my cousin Paul. The joke I told Paul is I'm at Penn, and this will be the first award at Penn given to an Offit whose name isn't Paul. <laughs> if any of you know who Paul is, you'll know what that means. And he's up giving some big lecture today at Children's Hospital, so he couldn't, he couldn't come. Um, but he's, 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 a good, he's a good colleague. And oh, that was my last slide, but I did want to show you one more Waldo. What is Hillary Clinton? And Lawrence Rockefeller doing in this, okay? That's a story for drinks, okay? <laughs> but, but they also had a big influence on, on, on everything that we're talking about. And of course, I mean, you know, here, right? There's Stephen and, and Judy and Henry Lynch and Fumi Olapati. You know, this is a wonderful picture taken with a disposable camera. I think I told you that story. Um, this is the Simba Consortium. And everybody in here I could tell an incredible story about, including this is our team up in uh, northern New Hampshire. So I took his, this is my amazing six-year-old. You know how grandparents are, right? I now understand what that whole grandparent thing is about. Uh, he's my little man. Um, and I took his mother at the age of three weeks to see Haley's Comet. And I took him at six years to see this eclipse. So it's an amazing experience to be able to circle back. And this is my third trimester daughter who's an intern at a hospital in New York that shall be unnamed who also managed to get off for two days. I don't know how she did that to join us. And I just wanted to say that, um, that these issues are cosmic issues. That's my metaphor, okay? And I'm showing you big things in the sky and big things on the ground. Uh, we're all in on BRCA. Um, it's been a privilege to work with friends who are colleagues and all of you. And I want to thank you again for this honor.